Hello and welcome to In The Loop Wollongong. I'm Nathan. And I'm Natasha and we have a slightly above average show for you this month. Come on now, we're always above average. Of course we are, of course we are. And you know why? Because coming up later on the show, we catch up with George Rose to talk about her work on Wollongong Central's touchy pop-up art installation. Mm. Just wait and see. We'll get experimental with the Bright Minds over at the Science Centre and Planetarium. And I'll be in the kitchen with the meadery cooking up something very delicious and very special. If you don't mess it up. If I don't mess it the up. The Laura Mercury's <laughs> Greg Ellis sits down with the one and only Dr Carl to talk about growing up in the gong. And later on in the show we'll be announcing the winners of last month's competitions. Now we head to Symbio Wildlife Park where Fairley from i98FM gets up close and personal with some meerkats. This segment is brought to you by Destination Wollongong and Internetrix. Hi, I'm Fairley from I-98. Today, I'm at Symbia Wildlife Park. I'm about to get up close and personal with some of the cutest creatures on the planet with their meerkat experience. I'm here with Kevin Fallon, who's the marketing manager of Symbio. He's done some amazing viral videos for the park. Kevin, can you tell us a bit about the park? Um, so, Symbio is home to all the Australian natives. Um, everyone knows we've got koalas, kangaroos, emus, wombats, echidnas. But what a lot of people don't realise is that we've got just as many, if not more, exotic animals here. Yeah, so we've got pygmy marmosets, we've got cotton top tamarins, common marmosets, which are a little bit bigger. And then apart from that, we've got ringtail lemurs, red pandas, tigers, cheetahs, and um, of course, everyone's favourite, the meerkats. Now, today we're going in to see the meerkats, which I'm so excited about. <laughs> How many fun. meerkats? Tell us a bit about them. Uh, so we've got two meerkats, um, Lone Wolf and Kapuki. We've got two because um, we're quite invested in breeding programs here at Symbio. So to give them the best shot of breeding, um, that's why we only have two and not a larger family. Um, but they're so interactive. Um, you'll always see one meerkat up on one of the higher perches. Uh, that's because they're on sentry duty. Just in the wild, what they'll do is, one will stand look while the other one's foraging or relaxing, and then they'll swap over. But what you can expect to see when you do get in with the meerkats is they're so interactive, they'll come up onto your shoulder, the keeper will get them hopefully up onto your head, and they're just adorable. You can actually have a lot of um, animal experiences here. I know with the koalas, what else? Um, so you can get behind the scenes with um, at least all the safe animals. So you can get behind the scenes with the red pandas, meerkats, um, all the small monkeys, as well as um, ring-tailed possums. You can also do exotic and um, Aussie Zoom tours. So if you want to sort of bundle a whole heap of the exotic animals together, um, yeah, you get to go in behind the scenes with them all. Um, same with all the Aussie animals. Then you've also got the keeper for the day. If you would like to get up close and personal with these gorgeous little meerkats yourself, just go to symbiozoo.com.au or check out Symbio on Facebook and you can book in to have your own meerkat experience. You call that a meerkat? This is a meerkat. What is this? <laughs> what a wonderful phrase. That I was, guess. yeah, okay. let's, let's go on. <laughs> if you want to hang out with some meerkats like Fairley, you're in luck. Simbio Wildlife Park are giving away two meerkat experiences. To win, share the episode or segment on your social media and let us know in the comments what is your favourite animal at Symbio Wildlife Park. Oh, you don't want to miss out on that one. And now I head into the city to chat with visual artist George Rose about her Australian first pop-up art installation, Touch Here. This segment is made possible by Wollongong Central. Discover the city. When it comes to art, the rule usually is you can look, but you can't touch. But that's not the case with the new art installation Touch Here at Wollongong Central. This installation was created by Melbourne artist George Rose and is a first of its kind in Australia. With the use of conductive paint, the murals become touch sensitive and trigger sounds from all around the Illawarra. How cool is that? Touch Here was created in collaboration with music producer Platonic Love. 
I was a bit of a jack of all trade. Um, I, trained, I was trained as a graphic designer, um, but I was never really a designer. I experimented and did a couple of animations on walls and then I started painting on walls and people started asking me to paint more things on walls and then I just went from there. So it was a really natural progression. I recently was here for Wonder Walls Festival, uh, which was really fun. It was the first time that I'd actually come to Wollongong. Um, so it was my first experience, and then this is my second. The whole space is a homage to, to Wollongong. It's like, you know, from the colours to the sounds to like the concept, and it's just something that I, I wanted people to really connect with. I think it's really important having artworks in public spaces and having artworks that is really accessible to people because not everyone gets to the gallery and not everyone finds a connection with artwork. I mean, to me, it is, it's like a language. And so if it's in a public space or if it's somewhere that people can just have access to it as easily as they have access to the shops, then it's really important because it, it, it engages them and it's something different that they sort of think about. Wasn't that cool? If you want to experience the touchy room for yourself, all you have to do is go to level two at the Gateway Building. How good is Wollongong? It's just full of art these days. Wonder walls everywhere. Everywhere? Yeah. Can't get away from them. Where's your favourite one? I like the scary koala thing at the back of Maya. It's an unusual pick. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mine's the gorgeous big mural of Megan Fox. That's Megan Fox? It's Megan Fox. I stood there for ages just admiring this gorgeous creature and realised it was Megan Fox. I hmm. usually think that, but then I realise it's a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> From art to science, bit of a jump. Did you go to the science centre as a kid? Yeah, I did. I love that um, giant metal ball where you touch it and your hair goes. Of course you did. <laughs> yeah. And just stay there for ages, yeah. pro. What Mine did... was the spinny one, you know, where you, you go round and round and round and round until you get really sick and Vomit throw up. Everywhere. Yeah, it was that kid, <laughs> that kid. Well, this month we talked to the science centre's Stuart Krill about the importance of getting little kids interested in science at an early age and hopefully not throwing <laughs> this segment is made possible by University of Wollongong. Science Centre is all about uh, engaging with the public, particularly the young, uh, and promoting science, technology, engineering and maths. And we do that in a number of ways. We've got our interactive hands-on collection, so we've got close to 100 interactive exhibits that will demonstrate different aspects of science, engineering, technology and maths. Uh, we also offer a range of science shows in the uh, South 32 Science Theatre and here in the planetarium we've got a vast selection of planetarium shows as well. The Science Centre here has got a fantastic history. Uh, it started round about 87, Glenn Moore, lecturer in physics, had just been on a sabbatical over to the US seen how inspirational science centres actually are and felt that actually a science centre and a planetarium combined would offer a lot and set up a, a science centre and over the initial years it was run very much on a voluntary basis. Grew in popularity, uh, designed for everyone from sort of five-year-olds up to 95-year-olds. The idea is to come along, particularly as a family unit, engage on the exhibits and the whole family does some learning and gets different things out of, particularly with the exhibits, by the learning experience. The children go straight in and press and pull everything. The parents tend to stand back and you know, watch and try and understand and give the children some guidance. And then of course the grannies and granddads like to read lots. So there's lots of information for them to gain the background to the exhibits as well. And obviously share that with the children. Certainly the promotion of the STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, maths is all around us and we know from various reports that experience and knowledge in these subjects is becoming more and more important, particularly for the growing career market and therefore it's important that we inspire the very young into these areas and certainly that's the role that the Science Centre actually can play. We've got many exciting plans, we're going to create uh, one of the first for the region, a, a maker space, which uh, we plan to eventually be accessible by the community, come along, gain access to various tools, equipments, textiles, sewing machines, all this sort of technology. Work on your own ideas, work with like-minded people and collaborative projects. Uh, so that's sort of one element that we'll have in our planned new facility. We want to 
introduced new exhibits. We've got an exhibit renewal program going on at the moment and we've seen about over the last five, uh, five six months, probably about six new exhibits. Uh, that will continue through to next year. We also want to bring the region a new digital planetarium. Our planetarium is incredibly popular, does some great stuff. A new digital system, uh, which I plan to be a 3D system, will be the first of its kind in Australia and certainly bring the universe to Wollongong. I'm in the kitchen with Ian from The Meter and I'm already salivating looking at the ingredients but what are we cooking today Ian? Today we're going to cook a uh, brisket baguette with the, uh, so it's actually our pick and shovel yep. and so you also get the uh, beef ribs with it. Oh sounds good, you need an empty stomach for that that's yes. for sure. So let's get started, what do we start with first? To start with I'll show you how we um, get the base of it cut up. So we actually have uh, brisket which I've slow cooked overnight for 12 hours, it's oh, in a nice goes. rub as well. So what are you doing now? So just slicing it all up, uh, just getting ready to go into the pan. And then we uh, add some onions, some capsicum, a little bit of beef stock. And then we, this actually cooks out for uh, probably about two hours or so on the stove. Um, ends up really tender and just uh, melts in your mouth also. So add all the fat and everything else into it and it'll just combine, make it really nice for us. And uh, tell us a little bit about the philosophy behind the meatery, because it's all about meat, I mean, can't kind of tell from the name or anything. <laughs> um, it's pretty, so we're, it's uh, based on the sort of your, your grills and everything else. So we do a lot of cuts of meats. You've got your eye fillet, your ribeye, uh, which is also a cube roll, um, the rump steak. Obviously we've got the brisket on and we've got pork ribs and beef ribs also. Okay. So next you've got capsicum. So we just slice it up also. Yep. So will you be putting all that together in the pan? So I'll start off and sort of the, the onions first and yep. also the capsicum, chuck in the meat. And as I said, this will actually cook out for about two hours to get to the end product that we're um, happy to serve with. So everything that you guys cook has a lot of time behind it? Yes, yeah, it definitely does. A lot, a lot of preparation um, to go into it all to get the final products. And then add some onions. Once that heats up, we'll just start sorting them off. You guys have a few, I guess, theme days. So yes. talk, to, talk to us a little bit about that. See, so it's a bit more so of an experience, isn't it, to come to the meadery? Mondays and Tuesdays, we do a monster schnitzel night. Um, I mean, when you're talking monster, how big are you talking? They would quite easily sometimes slightly overlap the plate. Like, we use a slate uh, plate on it. Um, it's, the base of it is a, probably about a 300 gram schnitzel, bashed out, crumbed uh, with panko crumbs. Delish. And then we add all the toppings to it as well. Yeah. So it's quite a large meal. You get a side of uh, chips and also coleslaw with that as well. It's always a crowd favourite, isn't yeah. it? After the Monday and Tuesdays, we have our all you can eat meat feast. So all you eat. All you all can you eat. Can eat. All so, you can, did you hear that? All you can eat. <laughs> which is quite fine. And we've got um, also a dessert buffet that goes with that as well. And you do a suckling pig. Yes, we do do a whole suckling pig. Um, we can we do that for the buffet every week, and we also have one which you can come in. Um, they're normally about a ten kilo suckling pig. It's all cooked in house as well. So the next step is to put the meat in. Yep. Yep. Certainly. As it doesn't have to be uh, in small, small pieces because it does cook down quite a fair bit, mm -hmm. uh, which will be fine. And all that fat that you can see there will actually uh, render into it and add to the flavour. Really, really good for us. Go. Just going to add a little bit of beef stock into this now. And as I said, then that will just simmer down for uh, for about two hours, and we'll come up on a low really, heat. Obviously. On a low heat, yes. Yeah. So the next part I'll do is I'll uh, we'll prep our baguette. So where do you get your meat from? Is it uh, locally sourced? Some of it's locally sourced. Our beef ribs, our pork ribs, the tomahawk steak that we have. Um, the brisket and also the, the lamb shoulder that we have uh, for the buffet, that's all sourced from uh, around the Southern Highlands area. Mm. So it's locally sourced and beautiful, Even beautiful better. meat. So what's next? Next we'll just fill, it, uh, fill up the, the baguette Might and we can get that ready to, to go into the, uh, into the oven along with once I baste the, the beef ribs. Yep. So what will you be basting the ribs with? With our uh, barbecue 
basting sauce that we make up also in-house. So there's quite a few ingredients into those. Um, Any secret ing ingredients? Uh, yes and no, not really, but <laughs> it's, not it's all right. Us. Don't want to say us. all of them. Um, base of it is is uh, your barbecue sauce, your tomato sauce, yep. there's uh, onion, there's garlic, there's a little bit of chilli in it as well. Mm -hmm. um, all the good stuff. All the good stuff and um, then yeah, once that, that takes probably about five hours for us to, to make up. Yeah, so how much would you put on? Oh, I just cut, cover it. Oh, really? Yeah, it. everyone it loves matter. sauce so on their ribs. Let's more the merrier. Um, like halfway through, I'll probably pull them out and then we'll um, base them again, just so it comes up really nice. Okay, so we can uh, put these in the oven and they'll probably be in there for about, uh, the baguette takes about five minutes and the beef ribs probably be about 10 minutes, cook time for it. Uh, just the top one. Top one? Yep, oh. <laughs> Still learning the ropes. It is smelling pretty good. Should we get these bad boys out? Definitely have a look at them and see how they're going. Oh, that smells so good. Nice beef ribs here. If you want to base those, and then yeah. I'll get the, uh, the baguette out. we just finish it off with a couple of pieces of cheese also. So what's next? So after they've been in the oven and beautifully nice and caramelised, we'll just plate them up and the baguette should almost be ready as well. So this is just our rocket and uh, rocket parmesan and Spanish onion sal salad. Yep. It pretty much goes on as a garnish for all of our uh, meats that go out as well. It's just normally on the side, just a small amount. And then we also have our chips. So all of our sides, normally all of our steaks normally come with uh, chips and a side salad. Mm -hmm. um, you can also choose if you wish to, to swap the chips out for beans, carrots, chats or another side salad which we can do um, like a just a normal green leaf or yep. a coleslaw or also. Should I try? You can. What's the best way to eat a rib? <sighs> just get it with it your hands? It just gets messy, yeah. Cheers. Enjoy. <laughs> mm. That was good. Mm -hmm. That was delicious and so much fun. Thank you, Ian. No problem. If you want any more information, you can head to the Meadery's website, themeadery.com.au. We will see you in action down there. Thanks. Do. I'm going to get into it. The Meadery are giving away two tickets to a midweek meat feast held every Wednesday from 7 pm. To win, share the episode or segment on your social media and let us know in the comments who you'll be treating to dinner at the meadery. I promise I won't be cooking. <laughs> Plus, for all In The Loop viewers, you can get a free dessert if you order the pick and shovel and mention In The Loop before March 31st. And finally this month, Greg Ellis sat down with Dr. Carl. Dr. Carl, he's here on the show. Oh, stop. Oh, ah. <laughs> this segment is brought to you by Access Law Group and the Illawarra Mercury. Hi, Greg Ellis from the Illawarra Mercury for In The Loop and the people of Wollongong. And today we're talking to a gentleman who grew up in Wollongong, who has been described by the National Trust as a national living treasure. Dr. Carl Krizlnicki, welcome to In The Loop. I'm, I'm, I'm honoured. Thank you very much, Dr. Greg, for inviting me. Thank you. First of all, I want to go back to the beginning. I understand you arrived in Wollongong when you were very young. Sure. So uh, we were refugees um, and uh, we escaped Europe and things were looking bad. Russia was threatening to invade into Finland. My father had already spent time in a Russian concentration camp, decided it was not really a future option. He wanted to explore again, seeing as how he'd escaped. And so we were going to be heading for the United States. Uh, I threw a fever in response to a smallpox vaccine. By the way, I love vaccinations. And so they, my parents panicked and the ship sailed away and the next ship was coming to Australia. So with our cardboard suitcases, we went onto the ship um, and ended up in Australia. Then and um, grew up in a refugee camp on the border of New South Wales, Victoria, then a little time in Sydney, then down to wonderful Wollongong. The good thing about Wollongong was not just the beautiful climate and environment and lots of jobs available, but for me, the Wollongong Library. And I started off reading my way through fairy tales of the world, starting off at Afghanistan and going up to Zululand and there were about 140 of them and, and it was just amazing how similar and different they were and then I immediately got into science fiction and funny stuff like that and the librarians looked after me and at one stage one of the librarians said how would you like uh, to read this book and I said sure where, where is it and she gave me a box and there were unnumbered pages 
in random order. And this was some French existentialist guy's idea of what a book should be. And so the library looked after me and blew my mind. Leading into when you were at the steelworks and yeah. uh, you actually designed a machine that would test steel strength. The fatigue strengths. And if you get a paper clip and you bend it once, well, it still looks like a paper clip, but you bend it 10 times and it snaps. So you've taken it beyond its fatigue limit. What you're trying to do is make sure that each part of the bridge is never stressed above its fatigue limit. So I was trying to find the fatigue limit of this steel, which was going into the Westgate Bridge in um, Melbourne, mm. and I found all sorts of problems with it. And I brought this to my boss and he said, look, I wouldn't be unhappy if you went and checked your numbers again and found you made a mistake. And then suddenly I thought, you want me to lie and fudge the figures. And I couldn't do it. And things got very unpleasant for me. Okay, looking back on your time in Wollongong, what sort of did you grow up in and what are your fondest memories looking back? Well, I've got, immediately say that I've got a memory of flashing my father with a mirror. And my father went in for a kidney stone operation. And every morning when the sun was right, my mother and I would sit at home and he would sit on the veranda and we'd flash mirrors at each other and try and do primitive messages in Morse code. And then of course we'd go and see him in the afternoon. That was, that was really fun. And I, I loved growing up there near the ocean and the mountain. I loved the environment of being able to walk up Mount Kira. I loved doing that for fun. I loved the fact that it was just such a, a beautiful place in, in the world and, and it was easy, comfortable, Living. And the University of Wollongong at the time you were there, it was sort of uh, establishing itself and growing quite dramatically. I know yeah. you go back a fair bit now. Yeah. Talk, tell me about the changes that have occurred there and, and uh, what you think of the university now. Well, it started off as a very small university as a branch of the University of New South Wales and then kept on growing and getting bigger and bigger and then turned into its own university. And now it has so many people doing world-class work. There's a dozen people there at least who are world leaders in their excellence and it's a really nice environment to do your study in. So it's changed enormously from you know, what it was back then to what it is now and it's a really nice place to live. I, I, I think it's a lovely university. Can you tell us about the book? Well there's, um, we've got a copy of it over here somewhere. It's like, right behind you. Right here. Oh. Exhibit A, so shamelessly copying the zeitgeist of the time, the doctor. So it's got three stories in there that are fairly longish and that you should know about. One is about gravity waves and how important they are. And the other one is about Bitcoin and there's another important, Bitcoin and the blockchain. Learn about the blockchain. It'll be like somebody coming to somebody else in the mid-80s and say, you know, these computers, they're going to be really useful. What's a computer? Right, what's a mouse? Right. So, and then there's another story. And then there's a whole bunch of short stories to sort of suck you in, like um, a giant baby planet. We've actually seen a baby planet forming into existence. Or why do dogs, when they look at you, tip their head like that? And I can explain that in a simple way. So we're ready to do an experiment here. So here we go. So make your hand like a fist. All right, now put the fist on your nose. Can you see my face? Um, not really. Not really, no. Now imagine you're a dog with a long snout. Now tip your head. And now you can see my face. So in many cases it seems that the dog is tipping its head when it looks at you, not to be incredibly cute, but just to be able to see what you want and be nice to you. We want to thank you very much for your time on In The Loop today. Thank you. It's an honour to be asked. Thank you very much. This month we are giving away two copies of Dr Carl's new book, The Doctor. To enter, share the episode or segment and let us know your favourite scientific fact. Also, keep an eye out for our extended interview with The Good Doctor coming to your social media very soon. Mm, now it's time to give out last month's prizes. Sharon Judd says Marjay should check out Cafe Parkview in Kayama on his next coffee tour. We'll let him know. Thanks, Sharon. You've won an epic prize pack, including a Victoria Capino black capsule machine and a complete home aero press kit. Very fancy. Very fancy. <laughs> the nature engagement tours, Scones and the Forest Walk, goes to Belinda Stedman. And Nicole DeRoy is the winner of a kitchen table experience for six, valued at $1,300, thanks to the Lagoon Seafood Restaurant. That is all the show we have all for you have this month. 
Let us know how much you love us by hitting the thumbs up button, sharing the show, liking us on Facebook, and subscribing on YouTube. Look, we're not needy, we just survive based on your approval. Yes. If you want to know more about any of this month's stories, you can find the links in the show notes below. In the Loop Wollongong is only possible because of the support of our partners. So please show some love to... Our media partner, i98FM. Our made possible by partners. Wollongong Central, discover the city. Where we got these amazing threads to mark from. <laughs> Thanks. Relativity, not just taken, created. The University of Wollongong. Watch out for those ducks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Advantage Wollongong. Destination Wollongong. Access Law Group. You want to use, but you don't want to use. Very smart people, you can rely on them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Illawarra Mercury. Internetrix. Lancaster Law and Mediation. Kazen Business and Financial. Our promotional partners, who you can see here. And our kitchen partners, which you can also see here. And they keep us full fed. Well, thanks for watching, <laughs> and we'll see you next time on In The Loop Wollongong. Bye. Free dessert if you want to go again. <laughs> we just... You're like, this one's easy. <laughs> and send us Stuart Creel from the Science Centre. Oh, I just messed that up. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah.